use that as a springboard to show you some things we learn about the devil in these two verses. It's important to understand that you have an enemy. It's important to understand who he is and what he tries to do and how he tries to trip you up and make you fall. We're not trying to glorify the devil, but the devil is real. He exists, and he attacks the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll show you that in the scripture here in a little bit. But there are some things we learned about Satan from John chapter 8, verses 37 through 45. We'll just recap the, the main headings from last week. Number one, we learned the devil is real. God good, devil bad. We learned the devil is real. We learned that he produces converts, that he has offspring. You are of your father, the devil. He is a murderer, according to the word of God. Verse 44 says he's a murderer from the beginning. He is a liar, John 8, 44 tells us. He also told us, Jesus said, that Satan is the father of lies. So if he's talking, he's lying. If his lips are moving, he's not telling the truth. He's the one where lies come from. He's the one who caused Adam and Eve to fall in the Garden of Eden through a deceptive lie that he told them. He turns the ear, deceptively leading people away from the truth. He tries to manipulate information that's processed in the ear, turn people away from God. So those are what we talked about, the things we talked about last week. While the devil cannot force you to do anything, he sure works overtime to lead us into temptation and cause us to fall. Cause us to fall for his deceptions and fall away from the truth, which was the very method he used on others, including his failed, his failed attempt on Jesus in the wilderness temptation in Luke chapter 4. This is why Jesus, in his model prayer, said for us to pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some translations say deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If Jesus in his model prayer is teaching us to watch out for the enemy who is on attack against us, then that's something we need to pay attention to and realize that as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, we're safeguarded, we're protected. The devil can't get through to you in any way, shape, or form, but he does try. And sometimes the Lord allows things to happen in our lives, so... We have to fight the good fight of faith and battle on. So we have to pray that we are not led into temptation, but delivered from evil, which means it's a possibility, but we guard against that at all times in the strength and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. As sure as there is a devil, there will be attacks against you, child of God. The child of God can prepare himself for and defend himself against these attacks, these lies and these temptations and deceptions of the enemy by doing some things, the first thing is being prepared for battle. Preparing for battle. You must be prepared for battle. Some people don't really realize this. When you get saved, you enter into a spiritual conflict. You don't really realize that before you got saved, you were already on the devil's side. And people have told me from time to time, ever since I got saved, things got worse. Well, things are really better, but you're feeling the heat of the enemy's pressure on you. And no one told you that you need to get ready for a battle because you are now on the victorious side with Jesus Christ in you and the power of the Holy Spirit in you. But you still got to have a few fights along the way. There's still going to be some battles along the way. You no longer belong to the devil. You now belong to Jesus Christ. And that makes the devil mad. So he comes at you as a roaring lion. And I'll show you that here in the scripture we're going to read. So be prepared for battle, which means we are going to engage in spiritual warfare as spirit-filled believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we have to do when we get, when we get into battle? Then the first thing we've got to do is be alert. Keep your head down. And keep your eyes open. Be alert because the Bible says, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. This is nothing new to the body of Christ. And everybody in this room, everybody watching online, is going through some spiritual battles. 
because the enemy comes at us to make us to, to, to fight us so we will get distracted and not do what God's called us to do. Every child of God is coming under attack from the enemy. All are under attack who are in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. So once you've gotten saved, you think, why does the devil keep coming after me? Why, why am I struggling with this temptation? Why is this a problem in my life? Because the enemy is trying to make you walk away from Jesus, which life in Christ is so good and powerful, we would never do that, but he still tries to make us fall. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 5 and 8 in the Amplified Version. I like the way this reads. Be well balanced. Be temperate. Be sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. Watch your step. Don't give ground to the devil. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Withstand him, be firm in the faith against his onset, rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined. You have, to play, you have a role to play in this. You have to be determined not to give up any ground to the devil. Knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brotherhood, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. You got people that you don't even know and never will meet. Clear on the other side of town, maybe even, or on the other side of the planet, who are going through the same thing you are going through. And probably in some cases, if we were to weigh it out, going through much worse than what we're going through. You're not the only one under attack. You're not the only one suffering. And there really is comfort in that. We should encourage one another when we know one another is going through a battle. We're here for each other to lift each other up, to pray for one another, and encourage each other. Peter is reminding the church that the church has an enemy, and that enemy must be watched out for because he is dangerous. He knows how to get to you. If he can get to you, he will not only tempt you to fall, but cause you to fail. In John chapter 8, there's a group of Jews who were arguing with Jesus back and forth. They told him that they believed Abraham was their father, and Jesus told them, if Abraham were your father, you listen to me and you believe what I say, but because you don't listen to me and you don't believe what I say, you, your father is the devil. And that's something you don't ever want to hear God say about you, right? So your father is not the devil, you're a child of God. So children, let's reinforce this. We are not of the devil. We are children of God. Bought and paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are destined to go to eternity in heaven. Spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. So that means because we are not children of the devil, we are children of God. We do not want to give place to the devil. So the places where you struggled before you got saved, don't go back there. Don't give him that ground. You've already reclaimed that ground for Christ. You've, you got victory in that area. Don't give him that space. We are not of the devil, so do not give him ground or place in your life. Watch out, steer clear of him, resist him. Or as the Amplified Version says, withstand him. The power of Jesus' name and the armor of God will enable you to defeat the enemy, the devil. So that's one way. Be ready, watch out, know he's there, he's real. So we're alert. We're not walking through life as a Christian with blinders on. We're aware now we have an enemy. We know where deception comes from. We know where temptation comes from. We know where evil comes from. It comes from him. So when we're confronted with that, we know the spirit that we're dealing with. It's not God, it's the devil. Amen. Another way to be prepared for battle is careful study and memorization of God's word. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Now I've had people through the years tell me they really are, are not very good at memorizing the scripture. I believe that it's easier than what you think. You can start with a simple one, Jesus wept. It's only two words. You can learn your first scripture that way, right? Seriously, though, you can memorize scripture, and you should try to memorize scripture. But for those who think you cannot memorize scripture, be encouraged. The more of God's word you read, the more will stick. That will be more stick than you realize. You don't have to memorize the whole book, but memorize those verses that have meaning for you, that bring power to your life. Those will be good verses for you to memorize. As you're going through the Bible, don't be afraid to mark in your Bible. Underscore those verses. I know some people are like, I can't mark up the Word of God. Okay, if that's your, your conviction, then we honor your conviction. But I mark up all my Bibles. I write things in my Bibles. If anybody ever gets one of my Bibles and I give them away from time to time, I tell them, you can have this Bible, but there's lots of notes in it, in the margins. 
They say, that's okay. I'd like to see what a preacher thought was important. So that's cool. But I underline way too much. But I underline things that are important to me. And then I found that as I read through the Word of God and I underline those things, they stick in my memory without even really trying to sit, uh, sit down and say, I'm going to memorize this verse. You'll be surprised by how much of the Word of God you know once you develop a consistent daily habit of reading the Word. Have a systematic plan. Read through the Scriptures in the way that God is leading you to do it. And follow that plan. And the more you read of His Word, the more you'll have stick in your brain. When you come under attack, you'll also be surprised how much of the Word of God will come out of you in that situation. You'll have temptation come at you and you'll say, wait a second, I know I read the Word of God says that this is a temptation from the devil and I'm not supposed to go there. And so you find you have the strength to resist that in the power of the Holy Spirit because the Word is the underlying force that enables you to stand. You've got something to stand upon against that attack. So make sure you read the Word, memorize it, and then you'll be surprised what comes out of you. Another way to make sure that you know the Word. Um, well, you must know the Word. Because one of the ways the devil attacks is by presenting a twisted version of the Scripture or a partial sip snippet that sounds right, but is slightly altered just enough to trip you up. But other times he takes God's Word and will somehow cause you to doubt what is said in the Word. And that's what happened to Adam and Eve. Now, this is not going to be on the screen. I'm going to read to you what happened to Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the Lord God commanded the man, saying of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So Adam and Eve have this whole garden. They can eat the fruit of any tree they see, except one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which tree are they not supposed to eat out of? Just say that one if it's too much for you. That one tree, right? What will happen to them if they eat of that tree? What did God say? You shall surely die, right? All right, now look at what the devil does. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. This is chapter 3 of Genesis. Which the Lord God had made and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. What did God say? You eat, you die. What did the devil say? You eat, you won't die. Here's what happened. He goes on, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. If the devil can get you to doubt the word of God, then he has set the trap for your fall. The Bible declares, O taste and see that the Lord is good. And yet there are times people doubt the goodness of God. People get saved, gloriously saved. Transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus has washed them clean. They have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. And something happens along the way and they doubt their salvation. They doubt the word of God. These are all attacks of the enemy who twists the scripture and makes you feel unworthy and lies to you to cause you to fall, to give up on God and walk away from this faith. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and if you know that, you can defend yourself against that. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. So Eve ate first, and then Adam just followed right along. So they both ate and fell. Then they discovered that they knew good and evil, they discovered they were naked, and they discovered they were hiding from God when God came to walk in the Garden of Eden with them that day. How did all this happen? Satan changed the truth of God's word into a lie. The word of God was always true, is always true, will always be true. But the devil will come at you and say, did he really mean that? He didn't really mean that, did he? Come on, you don't believe that. That's how he works. He tries to make you back up on what you know to be right. He changed the truth of God's word into a lie. But the truth is, now, 
According to the word of God, all humanity has been born under the umbrella of sin. And the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that the wages of that sin is death. So God was right, the devil was wrong. Of course, we knew that from the get-go. Now we're all under the penalty of death because of Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. So know the word. Learn the word. Live the word. Hold fast to the word. Rehearse the word. Listen to the word preached. Hear the word. Get in church and hear the word preached. Listen to your favorite radio preacher as long as he's good. You know, they preach the word like it's supposed to be preached. So you are able to defeat the enemy and recognize his lies, just like Jesus defeated him and recognized his lies in Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, it's called the wilderness temptation, where Jesus is done on a 40-day fast. He's in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness, the Bible says. He fasted for 40 days, eating no food. And then there are three episodes of temptation from the devil. In each temptation, Jesus answered the devil with these words. It is written. God says this, so I'm not going to do that. Second time, God says this, so I'm not going to do that. The third time, the devil started to get wise to Jesus. And he recognized that he was not going to make him fall unless he was able to use the word of God to make it happen. So the devil approached Jesus and said, throw yourself down from this temple pinnacle because it is written. He will give his angels charge over you. And Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It has been said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Get away from me, Satan. And he defeated him there. And the Bible says Satan went away from a season. Jesus defeated every temptation with the words that is written. So that works for Jesus. It will work for you. Hold fast to the word of God. Believe what you know to be true and rightly interpret it in the word of God. And stand upon that word as a firm foundation and firm footing for you. What's the next thing we can do to have good, strong spiritual warfare in our lives? Have a fervent prayer life. The Bible says, the three scriptures we'll read here, James 5.16 says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Your effectual, your effectual fervent prayer will prevail. Fervent means intense, aggressive, however it means to you, those words, that was the old King James word is fervent, but it means intensely pray, dig into the altar, get a hold of God, pray passionately, pray fervently, pray directly. Your prayer will avail much. Then Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So not only are you praying for yourself, not only are you praying for the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, and this church, your church, you're praying for one another. It's the body of Christ. You're lifting one another up. You're praying all the time. Keep an open line in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Well, I know we, uh, we teach people to say, In the name of Jesus, Amen, at the close of their prayers, as you should. But keep an open line. Just because you've said Amen doesn't mean the prayer time has to be over. Keep talking to God. Keep talking to God. Keep communicating. He's going to keep communicating to you. You'll discover in prayer that God will speak to you. He will reveal things to you. He will give you insight. He will give you direction. And he will give you revelation. He'll show you things you never understood before. He'll show you things about situations that you didn't know was going on behind the scenes. God will speak to you. He will reveal truth to you. And you need the strength you'll draw from him in prayer. The more you hang out with God, the more anointed, the more strong you become. So we need to pray. Strength for the journey comes through prayer. Strength for the battle, and there will be battles. Strength for the battle comes through prayer as well. Prayer is so significant that even the Apostle Paul, the premier apostle throughout the New Testament, even he asked for prayer from the Ephesian church. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19-21, he said, Pray for me that I'll speak what I need to speak. Pray for me that I won't shrink back. Pray for me that I'll be bold. And you think, this is the Apostle Paul. He's the number one guy in the kingdom next to Jesus. I think God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Apostle Paul is how they rank in my book. We're all equal under the blood of Jesus. But you know what I mean? I mean, he's the premier guy. And he's saying, I need you to pray for me. If he needs you to pray for me, how much more do we need to pray for one another? So pray for one another. Get your church directory and go through the list and pray for one another. 
Prayer is so significant that Paul asks for it. Pray fervently. Pray often. Keep an open line. Pray for your leaders, both spiritual and civic leaders. Pray for the president. Pray for the vice president. Pray for Congress. Pray for your governors. Pray for your mayors. Pray for your city leaders. Pray for your church leaders. Pray for the spiritual leaders over you. We need prayer. Pray for one another. Pray, pray, pray. You can't win. You can't lose if you pray. You'll win. So keep your prayer life going strong. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and remain full of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is success, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. John 20, verse 22, Before Jesus ascended to be with the Father, before the death, burial, and crucifixion of our Lord and his ascension, he said to his disciples, after he breathed on them, he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Jesus always had in his view the cross, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy, of the Holy Spirit in the believer. As is evidenced in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and throughout the book of Acts. So then he tells us in Ephesians 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine, we're in success, but be filled with the Spirit. If you're going to get full of anything, get full of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. These signs follow them to believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, glory to God. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These are the expectations of the modern church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the expectation of the New Testament church. As we've been telling you on Sundays, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit are for today. It wasn't just for the first century church as it was getting going. We need this love and power of the Lord flowing through us now more than ever in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our society is taking a turn that's unprecedented. We're seeing things and hearing things. Like this, uh, there are commercials that we see from time to time that says, if you were designated boy or girl on your birth certificate, well, however they're saying it, you're not designated boy or girl. You either are a boy or you either are a girl. But the world is taking this turn and forcing an agenda on the church and on the cities and on our world that's going to be so anti-God that it just is going to create tremendous battles. So we need, to, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to fight the fight and stand strong and present the truth to people when it comes time to present the truth. So seek the baptism earnestly. You're going to need this as a powerful weapon of the Holy Spirit. Seek the baptism in the Holy Spirit ardently, earnestly and ardently. Earnestly seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God will do great and mighty things through you as you are empowered to serve him. Another way to be prepared for the battle is to employ the power of the fast. Employ the power of the fast. Isaiah 58, 6. The nation of Israel fasted on a regular basis without any effect. And they began to complain to God. You're not honoring our fast. We're fasting, but we're still being persecuted. We're still suffering. The crops aren't growing. Things aren't happening, Lord. We're not being blessed. But we're fasting. We don't understand it. So God, tell us why you're not blessing us, even though we're fasting. And God responded, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness. Before this, he was telling them, There's a reason your fast isn't being blessed. You're fasting. But you're beating your servants. You're fasting, but you're ignoring your families. You're fasting, but you're ignoring needs in the community. So I'm not going to honor a fast like that. God says, it's not this the fast that I have chosen. To loose the bands of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? That thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. In other words, you don't hide from family members who have needs. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy help shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard, or your re-reward, the King James says. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord will answer. Listen, body of Christ. You just can't do what you want to do and ask God to bless it because what, some, some, what we do sometimes is not spiritual. It's not birthed in love. It's not birthed in the kingdom's heart. 
It's not spiritual to ignore the needs of the hurting. It's not spiritual to deny relationships with your family and not supply their needs if you have the ability to supply it. God doesn't honor that. That's not love. He says, he told the nation of Israel, you want your fast to be honored? You want to have success in life? You want your health to come? You want your prayers answered? Then you're going to fast. It needs to be like this. Fast to break the yoke of the enemy. Fast to accomplish what I'm asking you to accomplish. Fasting, gang, is not a ritual punishment of your body to gain favor with God. You're not punching a favor card with God when you fast and say, God, I'm going to live however I want to live, but because I'm fasting, I've got you by the hand, and you've got to do what I'm telling you to do. God says, no, I don't. I want you to honor me with a proper fast. Pagan religions think like that. Pagan religions punch the fast card. They torture their bodies because they're trying to appease an angry God. Our God's not angry. He loves us. He loves other people, too, and he wants us to be blessing them because we have been blessed to be a blessing. Fasting is not a weight loss tool. Sure, you can lose weight when you fast. And you can fast to break the yoke of bondage on your diet. But fasting is not a weight loss tool. Fasting is a spiritual dynamic that looses bands of wickedness. According to Isaiah 58. In other words, if the devil takes hold and successfully gains a toehold in your life or roots himself into a stronghold, the power of the fast breaks that grip and that chain. Fasting breaks the yoke of the enemy. And it's interesting here that Jesus said, that God said in the word, that ye break every yoke. I know it's the power of the fast, but you have to design, you have to be determined to work the plan of God and the tools God gives you to break the yoke of the enemy. And then you walk away from that chain as well in the power of the fast. The power of the fast breaks the grip of the enemy on your life. Fasting is a weapon in your spiritual arsenal that undoes heavy burdens, sets the oppressed free, and breaks every yoke of the enemy. Let me ask you something. Are you fasting for those in our community that need to come to Jesus? Are you fasting to help those who are hurting find Christ and have their needs met? It's wonderful that we're going to supply some families with Easter baskets. I love doing that. It's wonderful that we do it at Thanksgiving time, too, and we minister to people in many different ways in the community. But are we fasting that the yoke that's upon their lives gets broken? Are we fasting for them? Are we praying for them? Add that to it if you're not. We need to be fasting and praying for those who need to be set free from the heavy burden that they are under, the oppression that they are under, and the yoke of the enemy. Daniel fasted for 21 days for an interpretation of a vision he had. The angel was sent to him. He was told the interpretation of the vision after he got there. But it was a 21-day fast. Jesus fasted 40 days in the wilderness in his preparation for his encounter with the devil. 40 days. It's because he's going to meet the devil in conflict. The power of fast is a powerful weapon in our arsenal. So don't neglect the power of the fast. Amen? These are just some of the things you can do to gain success in spiritual warfare. We're going to pick up here next week. There's a couple others I want to read to you, two or three more, and a couple things we want to break into. So we'll pick up here next week. These are things that you can begin to do. I hope you were taking notes. I hope you were making the list as we got partially through it. And you shall call and the Lord shall answer. You shall cry and he will hear. If you employ the power of a proper fast. I encourage you, read all of Isaiah 58. If you are kind of curious about fasting and you're interested in fasting, then read Isaiah 58 and read the whole thing in context. Israel's promised a great blessing when they offer the Lord a proper fast. There are ways to defeat the devil. And the Bible gives us those to us very clearly. So we want to be alert. We want to apply the word. We want to memorize the word. What else do we say tonight? We want to have a fervent prayer life. And we want to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to employ the power of a fast. Amen? We will stop there. Father, we thank you for the word that's enabling us to recognize that we do have an enemy who wants to rob us of spiritual blessing and life in Jesus Christ. But we're alert and aware that his tricks now that we begin to study these things. And so, Father, we don't ever want to upset of us that the we're of our father, the devil. The, father, the devil is our father. Lord, you are our father. We're not going to go back to that old place. 
So keep us strong in you. Keep us healthy in you spiritually. Let us apply these things that we've learned to our lives tonight, Father. If there's anyone watching online or anyone here in the room that needs Jesus as their Savior, we pray a simple prayer with them now in the name of Jesus. Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Save my soul. I give my heart and life to you now in Jesus' mighty name. I receive you unto myself, and I begin to walk with Christ as my Lord and Savior now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray a simple prayer like that, you are saved. You begin to walk with Jesus Christ. Get into the church. Let the Lord begin to strengthen your walk through the materials that we'll give you and through the help that is available through the, through the Word of God. And Lord, we just pray that blessing upon those who are giving their heart to you right now. We pray your blessing upon this church. We bless this offering we're about to receive for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you all for coming. I hope this has been helpful for you tonight, and we'll pick up here next week. Amen. God bless you.